So welcome everybody um, to a, a session at the end of an already long first day of COP um, in parallel with the negotiations and the beginning of the negotiations in the World Leaders Summit. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce a session which is really about dialogue and cooperation. We've been talking all day uh, at the beginning, the launch first, first day of COP27 uh, and the UNFCCC Global Innovation Hub about the importance of radical collaboration, of innovation in partnerships and in the way in which we bring different parts of the global community together in practice, in, in the practice of innovation and transformative efforts to find and bind solutions together in such a way to achieve very, very structural change and a change of a very different order uh, to what we have so far. And very much responding to some of the recent reports from UNEP and others pointing out just how far off track we are and how much we need innovation now to get us towards a more transformative, structurally different set of options for our own ways of living. And particularly in, in developed world for the way for the ways in which we ask and expect to live and in developing world for the way in which we work together to support development that is sustainable and that leads to prosperous, flourishing lives. So we're going to start with a series of um, comments from a rather extraordinary and rich panel really encompassing Global South, Global North and a dialogue between European, the European Commission uh, and a number of partners across the world on the digital and green transition, the twin transition, and in particular the way in which digital technologies can support and enable sustainability and transformation for climate action, both decarbonization and adaptation. So I'd like to introduce uh, a remarkable lineup. We have a number of panelists who are joining us virtually. We have two panelists in the room. Um, so let me start by introducing Milagros de Camps, who is the Vice Minister for Climate Change and Sustainability from the Dominican Republic. We have, I think, let me just check, Emma Theophilus, who is the Deputy Minister of Innovation and Communication Technology from Namibia. Welcome, Emma. We have Alice Higiro, I think. Alice, yes, we are there. Um, who is Project Director in the Ministry of ICT and Innovation in Rwanda. Uh, we have Mr. Carlos Kahn joining us as the National Director of Innovation from the National Authority for Government Innovation in Panama. Welcome. We have Mr. Martin Wimmer, who is joining us as the D Chief Digital Officer at the CDO of the Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development in Germany, BMZ, and he is a co-host of this event. Welcome, Martin. And we have Walid bin Salman, who is the Vice Chairman of the World Green Economy Organization. Welcome to the panel. I think we can see. Yes, you're there. And we have Jan Wahlberg, who is the Ambassador for Climate Change from Finland. Welcome, Jan. Uh, we have True Skevetin, Skevetin. I might not be saying that right, True, and please feel free to correct me, who is the Head of Unit from the Sustainable Economic uh, uh, Development Agency of Sweden, CEDA. Welcome. Uh, in the room with us now, we also have Carla Montesi, who is the Director General for International Partnerships from the European Commission. So welcome, everybody. So let's start um, with some reflections from each of you and really building a picture. So we're going to start with the Global South and we're going to weave in and out with each other this picture of questions around how do we achieve a significantly different order of transformation in partnership, leveraging technology and thinking about the relationship between digitalization and sustainability and regeneration, ideally. So, Milagros, if I could start with you. How do you address climate challenges with the help of digital technologies in the Dominican Republic? And what do you see as being the role of international partnerships in support of that? Hello. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me here. It's a, it's a truly an honor to be uh, at this panel today. Uh, as you know, the Dominican Republic is a small island developing state, and this, we, we all know that small island developing states are extremely vulnerable to climate change. We, are, um, we share similar difficulties uh, with other countries in the region. Um, 
However, I think one of the biggest challenges that we face is access to finance. And mm -hmm. within access mm -hmm. to finance, mm -hmm. and aside, not within only, but aside from access to finance, is access to technology. And there's a big difference in access to technology between developed and developing countries, but also within Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, so it's a challenge that we face, and for small island developing states that are small economies, economies of scale, it's very difficult to access. We need uh, ways to finance a green transition, but we also need ways to finance a smart green transition. We need technology for early warning systems, something that we should have had last week or this week in, uh, in the Dominican Republic when we had uh, mass flooding in Santo Domingo, and we had no way to predict this flooding. We need access to technology also for agriculture, climate smart agriculture. We need access to technology for energy. We are very lucky that we have a private sector that has been driving the transition in Dominican Republic towards renewable energy. However, there's much that needs to be done. There's many, there are many needs that countries like the, uh, the Dominican Republic need uh, needs in terms of technology. Um, and with, within that access to finance to be able to finance that access to technology. So I think ways that we could help have a green transition, we could help have adaptive, adaptive capacities uh, for countries that are extremely vulnerable, like small island developing states, is, um, it's, it's very important. It's a priority for the Dominican Republic. It's a priority for the whole region. We've been trying to, if you see during the opening, it was mentioned uh, during all of the, the, the statements that the speakers made, um, being able to keep 1.5 alive is dependent on access to, to technology. So it's something that um, I know I only have two minutes and this is an introductory uh, question, but it's something that we, uh, we need a lot and there's a big gap in access in, in, in our region. Thank you very much. And you introduced the importance, I think, one of the very critical elements around innovation addressed at adaptation and resilience just as much as mitigation and often what is in fact a really critical feedback loop between them. So let us move to Namibia. Emma. How do you tackle the challenges and opportunities of a green and digital translation, uh, transition in Namibia? What challenges for you, for example, are, are very unsolved and would really benefit from international cooperation? Thank you so much uh, for the question. I'm very happy to be here uh, speaking to all of you. Um, so I think similar to, to the Vice Minister who spoke earlier from the Dominican Republic, we continue to have the same challenges. Um, as you know, as an African country, Namibia is almost a zero uh, emitter, but it's one of the worst affected countries when it comes to climate change. Um, we, for example, have had continuous droughts that not only affected our food security, but even our national safety and security, um, because that's sort of like a bedrock for conflict when you do not have adequate access to food for your entire population. But coupled with that, here comes the flash floods, here comes the wildfires. And on top of that, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we're already dealing with emergency disaster situations, and then a pandemic comes on top of that, and we're still dealing with emergency disaster, uh, emergency disaster uh, situations. So it's quite um, a difficult situation to grapple with. Um, and the biggest uh, challenge here is really access to financing and to mitigate specifically the impact of a change in climate in the country. Um, but we are transitioning towards uh, a renewable energy um, transition. Uh, for example, we are currently um, headlining a green hydrogen uh, program and project. We want to be the hub for green hydrogen, not only in our region of SADC, not only on the continent, but the world over. And this we do knowing consciously that we are still grappling with all these emergency disasters, but we want to set an example. But we don't have the financing, for example, to fully roll out that program and project. And this is where I think the collaboration comes in. And in Namibia's view, um, only hydrogen produced using renewable energy sources, namely green hydrogen is sustainable in the long term for us. And for this reason, the goal of the Namibian government is to develop 
green hydrogen production capacities, promote a rapid market uh, ramp up and establish corresponding value chains because at the end of the day, it has ripple effects. So this is really, really where cooperation will come in handy in order for all of us um, to help have access to financing for mitigating the impacts of climate change and help with our green transitions, which Namibia is currently championing on the African continent. Thank you very much, Emma. I'm speaking as, a, as somebody working from an organization that is European and that is investing a lot of effort in African entrepreneurship, particularly in adaptation. Um, one of the things we are seeing with deep uh, respect and enthusiasm is what is really now a much more bilateral relationship of learning, where the solutions in adaptation and leapfrogging, transformation on energy and water and land use are really useful lessons for Europe to accelerate its own transformation. So maybe there begins to be some of the, the opportunities for financing that starts to be in two ways. Let us move then to Rwanda, Alice. Rwanda is a leader in digitalization in Africa, especially regarding environmental services, but particularly government services. How are you using digital solutions for climate action so far? Are there success stories or stories that you can bring into this sense of what are we exchanging between one another? Thank you very much, Christine. And thank you, everyone, for talking to me. Uh, can you hear me all right? Okay, I was hearing them. You can. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, so, in terms of digitization, we have. Maybe I spoke too soon, Alice. Just one second. Let's just get the connection sure. stable. Okay, try okay. again. How is this? Okay. I'm still echoing. I don't know if my colleagues here. Okay. Maybe could I ask everyone online to just go on mute? Thank you. Okay, Alice, try again. All right. Um, thanks, Christian. I was talking about Idembo, which is Rwanda's e-government portal, which was established really to, 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 to achieve a goal of zero trip, zero paper, where um, citizens do not have to make unnecessary trips uh, to get government services and also in a bid to reduce carbon emissions um, in terms of reduced uh, trips and transportation. We have uh, something else that we call EnviroServe, this is uh, a private entity by the government, uh, which is a new way to the recycling plan. Um, as, as we move into digital transformation, we recognize that also digital technologies can contribute to waste creation, and so this plan was put in place to, to, re, uh, to reduce that effect. And also we have something that we call the cashless and paper-free uh, initiative, where well, we've seen over uh, digital payments go from 1.3 to over 111.9% um, over a span of 10 years uh, in terms of digital uh, payments. We also have something that we are working with, the ITU, to a framework called the EPR, Extended Producer Responsibility, to add a cost to production that will cater for end-of-life um, treatment of, of equipments that we are producing. And maybe just to wrap up, uh, we are promoting electric mobility as well, green mobility, and also street lighting using green technologies, uh, where we are shifting also from sodium to LED street lighting. For example, in the city of Kigali alone, or over 90% of our lighting has shifted, 91% has shifted from sodium to LED lighting, and we will achieve 100% by end of this fiscal year. In terms of challenges that we see and we are continuing to experience and we would leverage international cooperation, um, it's none, nothing too different from what everyone else has said, access to financing. A lot of our national treasuries uh, financing is, has competing priorities and therefore being able to tap into financing that is not limited to these national priorities would be a great lever. And also um, something else would be digital and green skills in our countries. The digital literacy is still very low, leave alone uh, green literacy. and so. Uh, Capacity building in this area is something that we are trying to leverage or we see as a, a, a critical lever in international cooperation. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. So let's uh, bridge then across from um, an environment that is applying digital technologies to the maximum extent but still has uh, significant opportunity areas where investment would come in really importantly to accelerate some of those changes. 
And if I can move to you, Carlos Khan, you are Director of Innovation, so this is, this is directly within your remit. How in Panama are you utilizing green and digital tech innovations to tackle climate challenge? And what do you see as being some of the key learnings in terms of developing an effective innovation ecosystem uh, in a local, regional, and national context? Hi, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon to the other colleagues. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, from our experience, I will begin saying that we basically began with a startup mindset. That's very key, and we focus on four uh, domains or pillars. First, knowledge-intensive human capital. That means that the skills and competence uh, through upskill, reskill, and continuous learning in the public sector shall be mandatory. Otherwise, we will not be able to tackle pandemic or even the climate changes intervention that we have been facing during the past three years. The second dimension or pillar will be workflow and process that support the business. Uh, the rec reconfiguration and thinking from a human-centric approach is something that it will erode the bureaucracy, but also include other knowledge dimensions. Um, what we have been using is a more standardized data approach as well as, for example, during this pandemic, you might observe how health science uh, travel to the geographical science to understand the where, just as Dr. John Snow performed in 1854. So it was something that we kind of correlate with geospatial data and how our countries can tackle that data and use the in-situ data and also standardize that data. And it will be something I would so, so, some type of talk into the two remaining pillars. The legal and regulatory framework is the third pillar uh, we kind of uh, observe in the, in the landscape. And this is very, very important because you cannot articulate or do you not perform a top-down approach or a bottom-up approach if your regulatory and legal frameworks cannot sustain massification? And if the regulatory and and, and the whole framework is quite obsolete. You have to, to be more agile and the, the norm has to be more updated so you can actually perform a twin transition. Otherwise, you will be thinking a GSM or, or, or GPRS when, when you cannot move to a 5G or 6G which are in the horizon. And, and, and the last dimension is IT infrastructure. Yes, we might need uh, finance but with the amount of data that is being produced now is something that we have to standardize and think about as a cross-border. That dimension we have been thinking since 2019. And it's something that for us as a country makes us possible to be the first Latin American nation to, have, to gain the equivalence for the European Union Digital COVID Certificate. And it's something that we believe is strongly enough that we are actually deploying a Copernicus Regional Data Center, taking and embrace us as a Panama a location and a service for the whole region. And that has proven record as a humanitarian hub. Uh, we believe that the air observation technologies is something that we all developing nation have to embrace and tackle for the sustain of the plan. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much indeed. And it adds a whole set of dimensions into how we think about what we're building here in terms of partnership and dialogue. Uh, Martin, I'm going to ask your patience for a second and pass first to Walid bin Salman, if you don't mind. Um, and uh, Walid, I'm going to ask you to introduce a note here that we haven't yet heard of. Uh, we haven't yet addressed, which is the question of inclusivity and justice and a just transition in the way in which we bring digital technologies and climate together. How do you see, especially from the perspective of the WGEO, how do you see the private sector contributing to open innovations and how do you see the role of digital innovation to help a just transition come about? Thank you, Christine. I would like uh, to thank everyone and uh, welcome the plenary 
this uh, what we today the subject uh, the really what we'll see is important and uh, and we're speaking today in COP27 and it shows how the you know the commitment that we notice from the country in order uh, toward the, the climate change. Uh, speaking about uh, the World Green Economy Organization and the digital transformation, you know the technology is as important as a uh, driver today to the uh, pillar of achieving uh, uh, you know the, the green economy. And uh, what we have uh, within this organization, um, we, we have it in a, in a unique way. So instead of just putting the uh, the cities and the uh, countries, you know, we, we put all together under one umbrella. So we have the cities, the countries, the youth, the private sector as well as one of the main uh, players, as well as the finance institution. So I'll give you a very good example how the transformation, the digital, digital transformation, as well as uh, uh, the disruption happening in the digital space. In the United Arab Emirates, uh, visionary leadership. We have set uh, a clear strategy and roadmap and been cascaded all over the country. And what we see uh, over the past uh, 10 years, how is the, the, the smart city model being evolved, and being, uh, the integration. What we see today, we see the, the renewable uh, become part of the buildings. Uh, we see the, the EV charging station, the electric vehicle become part of the, the whole grid. And what we see even in terms of energy efficiency, today we see a green buildings and green building codes and regulation. And in terms of that, we see the you know the, the green finance support how to turn of the private sector supporting the, the customer in order uh, you know to, to procure the technology that suitable to move forward. So in the United Arab Emirates is very clear uh, you know, target by 2050 to have net zero. And uh, in Dubai, uh, we have 100% uh, clean energy by 2050. The rollout of the green mobility uh, gave us, uh, you know, the, uh, the advancement in how to tackle all sectors. We're not only talking about the energy sector, but we're talking about the mobility, about the, about the finance, as well as the municipality and the environment. So today we have in Dubai uh, more than 10,000 uh, EV uh, cars with uh, very robust uh, infrastructure in the green mobility. And uh, in terms of renewable, for example, the green finance helped very much the expedition of implementation of the, uh, of the technology of renewable. And today we have more than 3,000 megawatts of uh, renewable. 50% already connected to the grid and the other 50% under implementation. And see how the past the growth in terms of technology is disrupted. I mean, if we're speaking five years back, the technology in terms of renewable, the efficiency was going like 15 or 18. Today we're speaking 20, 25% or 23% in the efficiency of renewable. So uh, the uh, technology and the private sector will be a key contributor to the business. So if we really want to achieve uh, the, the target by 2050 uh, or uh, the emitting of uh, the uh, 1.5 degree, so I think putting all together under one uh, holistic program in, for implementation is the best way. And in United Arab Emirates, we have really achieved um, a way where we set a model where all these uh, different uh, technology and different, uh, let's say, sector working together in harmony. And uh, I'll give you a very uh, good example. Today, uh, we set a target in Dubai to uh, reduce the CO2 uh, by 2020, and uh, we achieved that two years before the target. So it shows how the government, and uh, in support with the private sector, is really can provide the, the technology that can help in terms of implementation. So uh, looking forward definitely to share our experience and uh, looking to see even uh, the members to be part of this organization. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I understand you may need to leave, uh, leave the panel for, um, shortly. So just uh, also perhaps anticipating that one of the things we are really looking to mobilize here is a year of action towards the next COP in Dubai. 
So we're very much looking forward to coming and seeing what it looks like in action um, next year and try to see if together we can accelerate some of these transitions. Thank yeah, you. definitely. Thank you. Um, Martin, let me come to you now. Uh, we, uh, this panel is very much framed up in terms of, uh, of cooperation, of collaboration, and of the kind of innovative partnerships between areas in the world. In the panel earlier today, we heard a strong call out for action in terms of thinking about the African Union as the greatest hope that Africa has of really fully transformatively developing in a sustainable way. And in many similar ways, we know that Europe is acting as a union in so many ways to achieve a level of structural momentum in change that is unprecedented in the world at the moment. Can you please give us a sense of how, from the perspective of what's happening in Europe, how do you see the opportunity to leverage digital, digital innovations and to tackle the challenges of digital and, and green together? Um, what do you see in terms of international cooperation enhancing that? The chimneys of the Silicon Valley are smoking and stinking just like the ones in Manchester did. If you look at a car in the cold, you'll see the exhaust. You just don't see the exhaust from your notebook watching Netflix, but it's there too. Digitalization is responsible for more global CO2 emissions than air traffic by now. And 37% of the world still does not even have access to the internet. 96% of these live in developing countries. And just like us in Europe, these countries are eager to digitalize their society, economy, government. Six out of 10 of the fastest growing economies are on the African continent. And you don't need a quantum computer to figure out what that means for global decarbonization goals. A global perspective is key. The paradox is, Without uh, whatever challenges we, we talk about today, they will not be solved without shared digital solutions too. If you don't switch to smart energy solutions, a social ecological transformation is not possible. There's no way of cooperation between the democratic West and the global South without attractive, user-centric, up-to-date digital solutions, open data, digital public goods. If you can't offer sustainable infrastructure, hardware, value-driven software, green IT, ethical AI, without increasing dependencies on China and the US, we will not succeed. And we must deepen the cooperation with our trusted partners and strengthen multilateral coalitions. Therefore, BMZ strongly supports the team, team Europe uh, effort to link and advance the green and digital transformation, as you mentioned it. With this priority, we are chairing the working group Green and Digital of the European Multi-Stakeholder Platform for Digital Development with Sweden. It's called D4D Hub, and uh, I'm, I'm sure you're all aware of this. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. So you're introducing a topic which I think is of keen interest. Jan, can I ask you Finland's role in the D4D Hub? How do you see... Um, that the digital transformation becomes climate friendly by default? And how do you see this joint European actions having a multiplying effect? Thank you, Christian. It's good to be here. I'm going to be in Sharm tomorrow in physical, but, but from Helsinki this afternoon. Uh, I'll say first something about Finnish climate and environment strategy, because I think it's linked to the topic and also something about private sector and, and, and the whole of society approach. Uh, Finland is published last year its first climate and environment strategy for the ICT sector. And here I think we are globally pioneering a set of instruments that will reduce the carbon and environmental footprint of the ICT sector and reap the benefits of digitalization. So I think this is something, a tool we can share and discuss in the future. Uh, we are a global pioneer also in zero emission data centers and digitally able circular economy solutions. Uh, and on the whole society approach, Building sustainable, inclusive, and green digital economies requires attention to several interconnected building blocks, ranging from trusted, inclusive, and green digital infrastructure to build governance, digital skills, and digital innovation ecosystems. And I think innovation here is the driver. It's a dual agenda. It's green and digital, but it's also innovation and green. 
and here the role of the private sector, as many also, the Vice Minister from, from uh, Dominican Republic, for example, said it's the key. England is a member in a, in a group, group we call Champions Group on Adaptation Finance, and there also we have been looking that the, the bottleneck is often the private sector financing for adaptation, and I think it's even more difficult in adaptation than mitigation, but it's a topic that we, we have to address. But, uh, but, but Martin already explained a little bit the global gateway and the related Team Europe cooperation in digitalization field. We are strongly committed and we are a member of the D4D, club, the D4D uh, hub. Uh, there we prioritize green and secure digital connectivity, innovation ecosystems, development and partnerships for fair, fair data economy. We have been focusing quite a lot on Africa. We have a, a circular economy expert in African Development Bank and we are working also kind of with, with the equal opportunity, gender equality participation, but I think it links to a kind of our topic of the day, the dual agenda of green and digital. How do we make the European agenda also part of our foreign policy and our diplomacy? Thank you. Thank you very much, Jan. So we have this interesting set of perspectives from a need to achieve development full stop and access to finance to accelerate the introduction of technologies to some of the challenges where the technologies we are talking about and relying on are some of the root causes in terms of accelerating emissions and where some of the really challenging questions also in a European context is how to avoid social fragmentation and a breakdown in trust, which ironically has not been helped by digital technology. So it's a very diverse picture through you are sitting in the middle of that as, as somebody working in one of the leading development agencies in the world bridging Europe uh, and, and Africa in particular. Um, what do you think about the possibilities here in terms of Europe playing a leadership role, in terms of Europe learning from the Global South in this dialogue between Global South, Global North, obviously not only Africa but the full system of the planet. What scope do you think is adequate in the way we think about global, national, regional, subnational to shape a sustainable transition? True, do we have you? Thank you. Ah, okay, there we go. Yeah, thank you very much. And extremely happy to, to join from Stockholm um, to COP27. Uh, and also to co-host this session together with the European Commission. And uh, I w just wanted to echo what you said in the beginning about the radical cooperation. I'm very happy to hear that that term. And I think this is uh, this is what it's all about. I mean, both the digital and green transitions are truly global, in the sense that we uh, the challenges uh, are transmitted. Uh, but the opportunities and the solutions are also in, in many ways uh, joint and we need to, to work jointly to, to find these and to, to cooperate. So I'm extremely happy that we're having this, this uh, joint dialogue today uh, to try to support further radical uh, cooperation. Um, Digital and green are also not only uh, global, they are also clearly uh, interlinked, as we have already uh, heard. And for CEDA in Sweden, we work to strengthen countries' capacities and abilities regarding environmental, sustainable development, and to support strong ownership uh, from decision makers at different levels. Um, but I wanted to mention, it's difficult uh, so late in this distinguished panel to mention anything that hasn't been mentioned already. But if I try, uh, there are two perspectives I wanted to, to, to add on the digital development uh, in particular. And that's the, the rights-based approach and uh, the gender equality. And I think Sweden is extremely proud and happy that we have supported uh, increased women's access to technologies, women as entrepreneurs in tech, and tackling gender-based violence to create a safe online environment for women and girls. Um, we are also part of the global debate and discussions where we promote human rights-based approach and gender equality, and, um, and to, to support innovative ways of uh, increasing access under the uh, parole of leaving no one offline uh, through partners with such as uh, GSMA, um, DIAL, uh, World Bank and the UNCDF. Um, so just to highlight the rights-based approach and the gender equality. 
secondly, I, I wanted to also mention the digital the public goods and uh, the digital principles, um, which we are also part of supporting. Uh, we were one of the founders of DIAL together with, among others, uh, Germany. Um, and, and on the digital uh, principles to highlight in particular uh, the importance of taking into account existing ecosystems um, and of designing with the users uh, for, for whatever purpose you are trying to achieve with the, with the digital. And then thirdly, uh, it's on the dialogue. And here we have uh, an extremely elaborate and we're extremely happy to be so active in the EU D4D uh, hub. Uh, where, for example, we are cooperating very closely with, with Germany, uh, which was already mentioned. And I think on this we can uh, elaborate further, and we are currently looking at a Team Europe initiative, which would uh, target uh, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa on regulations within I ICT. So we're very uh, kind of um, enthusiastic about that uh, initiative and looking forward to to put that into place in 2023. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Carla, we come to you uh, towards around this um, this whole pan, uh, panoply of perspectives. I'm then going, then going to move to a dialogue and to open up the dialogue a little bit about principles of mutual learning and collaboration. So I would like to pass to you, Carla, first, just to reflect on the European Commission's perspective on this sitting across multiple nations with all of their complexities. What do you see or what are the European Commission's priorities in advancing the twin transition? And why do we need a Team Europe approach to mm -hmm. enter into this dialogue? Yes, many, many, many thanks. And many thanks for organizing this event and for bringing all us together for these big challenges that we have in front of us. I think that listening to all the intervention, it's clear that uh, we are clearly all committed in assuring it is, uh, uh, I would say, twin between digital and the green transition. Overall, it's a global issue. We know very well that we have a, a geopolitical issue facing these challenges, and we all have to work together in building this. Uh, it was already mentioned about the digital technologies. We know that the digital technologies used in the right way can be really powerful, uh, can have a really positive impact in achieving uh, this green transition. We know also that looking to our, the development of our digital society, digital economy, we know very well also that we need to reduce also the impacts on climate that is just created by this strong digitalization. So we need to also look to the digital technology, having in mind also the energy consumption and also all the subject, the big subject of electronic waste. These are the challenges that we have in front of us. What we, are, we want to do as the European Union, of course, we really want to work in partnership with many of our partners around the world. Um, digital, the twin, digital and green transition, it's clearly one big important priorities that is covered under our global framework for our external cooperation, a global gateway. And as was mentioned, the priority for us is clearly to achieve this human-centric approach to ensure that we have a fair, just, clean digital transformation. It's very, very important. As was mentioned, the challenge is so big that we need to work all together. It's just join forces, exchange experience, exchange experience with the public sector, but also with the private sector, as was already mentioned, it's very, very important. One of our tools, of course, is to work improving access to finance, uh, so creating new financial instruments to allow also to finance these new clean digital technologies, but it's also working on skills, working on governance, working together with uh, our partner countries and our member states, our European financial institutions. You mentioned the Team Europe approach. This is what that means. So really pushing together, pulling together expertise, funds from our member states in European Union with our financial institution in order to be able 
to work together with our partners in the South and they've been much more impactful altogether. Thank you very much indeed. So let us open up then to this question, really building on this notion of working with partners across the world, across the planet, and working on, on shared needs and shared challenges. And I'm, I'm going to raise a little bit, um, a slight provocation, uh, let's say an extension of the provocation to digital technologies. I think one of the challenges is definitely the energy consumption Another is waste, but there are three more that concern those of us working in the core of innovation, and that is digital technologies often have a path dependency on the notion of automation. So actually that's often at odds with a really deeply human-centered perspective. They're often wired for efficiency, and we begin and need to learn from nature around ecosystem services that are much more about redundancy and resilience and, and repetition. And we have built, and I'm speaking here in developed countries, we have built a world based on digital technology supporting variety, which encourages consumption, which encourages us not to live with a different mindset. So this gives us already a set of design challenges for how do we rewire the whole principles of what we're thinking about technology and service of. And I think one of the things that I'm certainly speaking from, a deep respect for the learning that is, in, that is uh, really enabled when we start to partner across different realities and we really see what local context, uh, as you were saying so rightly, this notion about taking into account existing ecosystems true and designing for local context and needs. What, and here feel free to jump in anyway, anyone, how can we enhance the, the opportunity to make partnership about accelerated learning? mutual learning, mutual cooperation, mutual collaboration, where there is really a chance to start to integrate different possibilities, connect, and look at the way in which we do think of the planet as one connected system. We've, I've heard many of you talking about open data, open architecture, shared regulation, common standards, the way in which we think about cr thinking planetarily, designing planetarily. W how can we do that? How does an initiative or partnerships or dialogue, the partnership between Team Europe and others enable that kind of transition. Who would like to speak first? Um, I, I can go in here. Okay, so first Emma and then Carlos, I think you were preparing to speak. So first Emma, thank you. Well, I, I think from an African perspective, um, and this COP27 is happening on, an, on the African continent. Um, one is to level, level the playing field, um, have honest and frank com conversations about the impacts um, that this has had on especially um, least developed countries, small states and developing countries like ours. And, and for accountability um, to then uh, be a... a, a, a a point of discussion. And once we have leapfrogged from that, I think we can explore sustainable and equitable partnership. One, and I, and I say sustainable and equitable because it has to be an equal partnership where it's a win-win situation for, for everybody. Um, and the results of whether it's uh, shared learnings or shared investments do not benefit one or the other. Um, and especially for countries like small states and least developed countries and developing countries like ours, we cannot afford um, to have other underlying issues coming into this type of discussions when we're talking about the sustainability of, of the planet and the survival. It's, it's, from our end, it's about survival. So, so we really want to have um, frank conversations and sustainable and equitable partnerships to address um, the issues affecting our countries where climate change is concerned. And once we have those frank and open and accountable conversations, I think that is the first uh, step towards trust. And, and that is the first step towards um, a true collaboration for planet um, and, and, and not uh, taking an individual perspective. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. So accountability, collective, individual, together, Carlos, can I pass to you? I'm going to ask you to keep these very, very short so that we really build on each other. Carlos. Thank you. Um, I, I will focus on the legal and regulatory framework. If we do not update the regulatory frameworks, the effort will, will kind of 
provoke a, a less velocity and acceleration that require to tackle these complex problems. So I will focus on, on having that sorted out and then have the standards and norms also in parallel. So we can build this uh, dream that we are talking about here in a more down to air way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Alice, let's go to you. Um, thank you so much. Mine is to say that. No, nope, sound is not working again. Let's try once more. Try again, Alice. How is this? Yes, okay, go. Great. Uh, so mine is a simple intervention um, to say, uh, you, say, you did mention that digital technologies are some of the creators of the problem that we're here talking about. And, and one of the, the reasons is that they have limited, like the digital tools or devices have limited or short lifespans, which means that production then happens more regularly than necessary. And so I, I believe that across regions, we can also collaborate in and incorporate this even in our trade agreements to increase the lifespans of these digital tools and, and devices of which in the global south we will mostly find that we we are the ones importing most of these tools and vice versa so um, if this can also be um, looked at within our trade agreements thank you thank you that's a that's a fantastic pragmatic angle in how we think about cooperation very real terms thank you jan can i go to you thanks christine i'll be really short you mentioned that uh, about automation and, and kind of the need to rewind how we are doing things. I think there are two big topics that we need to take into our discussions as well. One is circular economy. Rwanda is hosting a World Circular Economic Forum in, in December, and I think it's about green jobs, it's about green growth, and, and, and it's a new way of thinking and economy. So I would just hi highlight that we need more discussion on circular economy. The other one is, is nature-based solutions. There is, um, even today, I think there is a meeting with, with the leaders on, on the forest, forest and climate leaders partnership. It's about the nature agenda, about the forest agenda. So those need to be bring into the green and digital agenda, those two topics. Thanks. Thank you. So we're really talking about key design principles in how we're thinking on the, what are we grounding these cooperative efforts on. Milagros. I had um, something that True touched upon earlier, and it's uh, that this twin transition, this twin green digital transition is just inequitable and especially in terms of gender, uh, gender perspective because what, what we're seeing is that, for instance, in countries, in, developed, in developing countries, uh, most of the green jobs are cre that are created or that are traditional uh, green jobs in our countries are mostly dominated by men. So we have uh, about 80% of the jobs created that are uh, in positions where men are traditionally occupied. Women are the most vulnerable in terms of climate change. And one of the main uh, reasons is also access to land, uh, to land ownership. And what we're seeing is that a digital transformation and decarbonization agenda can bring um, trillions in money and in disciplines that are also mostly occupied by men. While when we go uh, towards STEMs, STEM uh, disciplines and we see that only about 34% of those uh, disciplines are also occupied by, by women, so mostly occupied by men. What we're seeing is that women are not going to be included in this green uh, and digital transition if the gender issue is not addressed, if the gender gap is not addressed. And we saw that COVID unfortunately reversed a lot of efforts in equality and a gender sense dramatically, and we are not catching that back up. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to bring this nearly to a close. Carlo, if I can ask you, on behalf of the whole group, given that you represent an area of the world that has spent decades working on a peace project logic of cooperation and collaboration, and has includes amongst the Green Deal also things like the Climate Pact, deliberately working on a bottom-up, down, down and sideways on partnerships. If there is one thing you could name, what, would it, what do you need, what do you see as a need to make this kind of dialogue successful and this sort of partnership successful in bringing digital and green in partnership 
the Global South and the North in partnership, Team Europe in partnership with Africa, Asia, South America. I think what we, all of us, we have already said, working together, sharing experience, learning together. There are things in which in Europe we have already progress. We mentioned the data infrastructure. We know very well that we need absolutely many of other continents to develop data infrastructure. We know very well the impact on energy that have it, this data infrastructure can have. We know that in Europe we have taken a lot of work for many years, developed now some guidelines in how to build that infrastructure, saving energy. I think it is kind of a dialogue, pulling together, exchanging experience, learning by each other, and building this digital transformation that we all need in Europe and around the world. Thank you very much indeed. I'm going to ask you all to stay online and stay here. We're going to have a few closing comments from Masamba Toye, who is representing and leading this entire initiative. And it's been a day of talking about shared infrastructure, shared data, building the conditions of trust. Emma, I really want to bring back into this, into this closing session that notion of frank and accountable conversations with one another on what we're trying to do. And Martin, thank you for reminding us that we must not just romanticize what we're doing here. This is difficult and tough design. Masamba, over to you. Thank you, Kirsten, and uh, uh, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, indeed, a uh, great panel, because digital is something important. Um, we are talking about the twin green digital transition. And what we strongly believe is that digital will be a key lever for the green transition, something that will be needed. And one important aspect is that um, developing countries particularly will need digital technology to be able to leapfrog. Because we are always talking about mitigation of climate change. But the approach to mitigation to climate change in the global north and in the global south will be slightly different. In the global north, it will be mainly about decarbonizing infrastructure that are already in place. But in the global south, where you do not have a lot of emissions, it's more about development, but developing following a clean pathway. So it means that the global south will have to leapfrog, and uh, sorry, the global south will have to leapfrog and not follow the development pathway of the global north. This leapfrogging will only be available if digital technology as a key leverage is fully utilized. So it means that this concept of not letting, not letting anybody behind is extremely important. If you want the global south not to develop following the same pathway as the global north, their access to digital technology is critical. This is something important. So it means that collaboration is needed. We need radical collaboration across nations. We need to work together on innovative solutions leveraging digital. Um, but the aspect that is really interesting here is that we have a virtuous circle we can leverage. Because working together helps to create build trust. And trust gives us willingness to collaborate even more. So this aspect is extremely important and nobody should be left behind and everybody should be common around the table for a collaboration on digital. So thank you again for this very, very interesting panel. And we are really grateful that you, you, this happened in the Global Innovation Hub that we are hosting. Thank you again. Thank you very much, everyone online, for your uh, patience with the technology and the system. And uh, don't forget, we have not forgotten access to finance as well. This we will talk about tomorrow. Thank you again.